Hi, hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me. This is uh, last track for HeroPython. Um, my name is uh, Jean-Philippe Casey. You can reach me on Twitter at JP Casey. Uh, I work at uh, Shopify in Montreal. Uh, I'm French Canadian. I'm also an organizer of the Montreal Python user group. Uh, we do uh, monthly meetups with little conferences and um, project nights also. So if you're ever in Montreal, um, out to our website, see if we have anything on. I uh, would be glad to uh, see you there. Um, today, I'm here to talk to you about um, types and study type checking in Python. Uh, before we go in depth, I want to bring some um, theory in it. So the first thing I'm going to want to talk to you about is type systems. Um, it seems boring, but it's, oh, it's fun. You'll see. <laughs> so first thing we're going to check is um, what is a um, type system, of course? The, uh, Wikipedia, um, the Wikipedia definition is quite hands-on on it. So it's a, it says that in programming languages, a type system is a collection of rules, a set of rules, um, that assign a property called a type to various constructs uh, composing a computer program, such as variables, expressions, functions, or um, modules. So it's basically just a set of rules. Um, but also, it has, it has lots of purposes. Um, of course, the first one is we have type systems in place to help us reduce and identify um, pot potential bugs we have in our programs. Um, it also, um, also it's going to give us uh, meanings to a sequence of um, bits. Because um, if I just give you this uh, eight uh, bit, uh, we have no idea what it is. So it could be either 72 if it's an integer, could be the letter H if it's an ASCII um, Character set. It could also mean uh, could also mean that it's a true Boolean um, value in uh, for C, for instance, because it doesn't equal to um, to zero. So let's dig quickly to some uh, fundamentals. Um, so with the type systems, uh, it's going to be studied by uh, type theories. It's uh, lots of math, lots of computer science, also. Um, and also, so a, program, a programming language is going to need a um, type checking in place. And the uh, typing was just going to be meaning that it's assigning a type to a value. Um, type checks could be done either at uh, runtime, um, it could be done at compile time, it could also be um, manually annotated in the source code, so you're going to declare the type before a variable, or the um, language, the type system, I mean, could also automatically infer. So without having to declare what the type of a variable it is, um, the type system can deduce what it is. And our, like I just said, typing will give a meaning to a sequence of bits. Um, so with type systems, we're going to have, of course, um, type checking. Um, type checking or type safety, it's uh, the process of uh, verifying and enforcing a uh, constraint of the type system. So it's just checking and making sure that the parts have been connected in a meaningful and constant way. So for instance, we cannot add a string to a list. It's the type, the type system doesn't, doesn't work like that. With type uh, checking, so it's going to prevent illegal operations. Um, like I said, adding a list with an integer, for instance. Um, it provides also a memory uh, safety measures, so a good type uh, checking for a good type system is going to uh, reduce um, the buffer overflows or the out of mind writes uh, that you can do, which would lead to corrupting the running executable or the memory in place. Uh, it also helps for uh, logic errors, so to disallow you working with different uh, semantics. Uh, so with type checking, is we're going to have type safety, like I said. Uh, type safety is basically just enforcing the types in a programming language. Uh, it's a requirement for any programming language, uh, and it's also closely linked to the memory safety of your, um, of your executable. Um, people are often going to compare it to strong typing versus weak typing, um, so it's only going to be whether if it's, what is the type safety, if it's memory safe, um, is, it safety type, uh, is it static type checking, or is it going to be dynamic type checking? However, the problem is that for many languages, um, many languages are too big for, uh, for having human-generated type safety proofs. Um, so they would require thousands of cases. However, there are some languages um, that have rigorous defined schematics 
uh, some, uh, for instance, some ML-based uh, languages, um, they have been, and they have been proven to meet certain definition of type safety. Uh, Haskell also is another language that if you uh, do not use some unsafe uh, methods that are mostly I.O. operation, uh, you, can, uh, you can provide a, a good level of type safety. Um, I also just want to talk quickly about uh, Coq, which is a programming language. Uh, well, mostly an, it's an iterative term improver, which was written in uh, OCaml. It's over 26 years old. It's a dependency type function language. And, uh, so, and there's, a, there's a browser that was written in this programming language called Quark. And the web browser has a kernel that has been formally verified by Coq. So, so it means that it, it should be almost um, bug proof or uh, uh, secure, as in no buffer overflows or no bugs um, related to the type system. Um, so we have the type safety type checks. But to have type checks, there's two ways of doing it, of course. Uh, we're going to have the, stat the static type checking, which is going to be done, of course, at compile time. Um, in a static type checking, every variable is going to be bound to a type during, compile, uh, during the compiler phase. Um, it provides us with a good, uh, some good things for us. So it operates on the program source code. It doesn't have to run the, uh, the executable. Uh, and since it runs on the um, source code, it helps you to catch bugs earlier in your development cycle. And it's also going to give you a higher level of confidence, in my opinion. Uh, and it could be, all depending on which type system you use, it could be also a limited form of formal verification as to whether your program does what it's supposed to do. Um, some quick static type check language we have is, of course, C, C++, uh, Java, Go, and like I said, Haskell and OCaml or, or some of them. Um, there's a lot of other also, uh, languages that are type checks, static type checks. Um, the, other, uh, the other type checking we have is, of course, uh, dynamic. So instead of doing the um, type checking at, at compile time, we're going to have it at runtime. So while the uh, program is executed, while it's running. So it's literally the process of referring type safety during runtime. Uh, compared to static uh, type checking, here, every variable uh, is going to be bound to an object and not necessarily to a type, because the type has to be, um, has to be um, inferred during the execution. Uh, this gives you, uh, usually, it will allow compilers to run more quickly, because it, remove, it removes a phase from the compiler, which is the um, type checking. It, allow, it allows also interpreter to, um, to interpret dynamically uh, new code. So for instance, Python, we have eval. Uh, it also allows duct typing and easier uh, metaprogramming. Uh, the last two are not diff only um, for dynamic type checking uh, language, because, for instance, with um, C++, we have templates. We, and with C++ templates, the um, type checking is done at runtime. And another example of dynamically type check language, of course, we have Python, Ruby, uh, JavaScript, PHP. Uh, but we also have Clojure and Lisp, uh, which are uh, also compiled um, uh, Lisp, which is a compiled uh, language. So it's not only a dynamic language, means a dynamic type um, check language. There's also a combination of both. Um, like I said, for C++ templates, there's uh, for Java and C, when you uh, downscale um, uh, a variable, uh, the um, type checking is going to be done at runtime. And for C, you can also just downcast everything to void, and the compiler will never complain. So that was type systems, but since Python is a dynamically typed language, um, what can static type uh, help us? As I said, uh, it does help us reduce the number of bugs, and by reducing number of bugs, it will help us to identify more quickly bugs during our development process. Uh, with a static type language, people will often say that um, since my language is static, statically typed, I do not need to run in tests because my tests are handled by my type system, which is, I don't think it's true, but also people are gonna say that a bug is merely a poorly typed, uh, poorly checked type. And this brings also the, um, I don't know if you remember, uh, Heartbleed, which was over a year ago. Um, when it happened, uh, people complained that if OpenSSL had been written in a language with a better um, type system, the bug that uh, hard, the, 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 the bug caused by heartbeat would have never happened. It's up to discussion. Maybe yes, maybe no. We'll see. 
All right, so let's get back to some Python. Let's say I have this um, method, uh, Fibonacci method. Um, if I want to uh, run it, Fibonacci 42 is going to give me the, uh, the, f the 42nd uh, Fibonacci number. If I wanted to test that method, one quick way of uh, doing that would be to assert, for instance, Fibonacci 0, 1, 2, and maybe another bigger number just to make sure that the method does what it's supposed to do. Um, so by only testing those uh, five, um, five numbers, let's, let's, let's see what else uh, I can do. So let's say I have my entire set of possibilities of various types, various um, uh, objects I can have. And I have my set of integers, which are here. Um, the test that I have only tested the uh, five integers, so it's like almost nothing in the entire set of possibilities I could, that I have which means that if I have um, floats, for instance, Fibonacci 0 0.0 or 1.5, um, in the case of my method, it worked, but it doesn't really, this doesn't really give me what I wanted. And if I do a Fibonacci 14.32, it's, uh, it's gonna explode right there. Um, this means that with my entire set of possibilities, um, by using static type checks, I would have been able to, here I have my set of floats, but I would have been able to just remove them from my set of possibilities, since floats are, so, since the Fibonacci cannot be calculated with floats. And uh, same thing with, uh, string, uh, with strings, yeah, with list, I don't need those. So this, gives, this reduces the uh, set of possibilities that I have to test against. Um, what is the current state of um, static checks in Python? So Python is a dynamic language, uh, but we do have some uh, static static type checks that are happening. Um, one of those that I looked upon is uh, JetBrains PyCharm, so the, uh, the IDE. They have been, uh, so they added um, type hint and type checker for uh, over five, four or five years, yeah. Uh, and the way it works is they use doc strings for Python 2, and for Python 3 they use the function notation that I'm gonna talk a bit after. And this provides the IDE with information on what uh, types the uh, either methods or variable are supposed to be. So it's, it gives the, um, the IDE user some basic code completion. Uh, so as I said, it works with uh, the parameter passed to a function, uh, return values also, and local variables. Uh, some example that I took directly from PyCharm's documentation. Let's say I have this method, and for PyCharm to do some, um, some uh, type hinting, I, would, uh, I could do um, I could add doc strings with their specific syntax. So here, for instance, param A, B, C would be uh, integer, and this would help PyCharm to, um, to give me uh, either auto-completion based on those uh, choices, or to warn me if I give a string, for instance. Um, PyCharms went from a simple, uh, class, uh, simple class types to a really more complete type checker with, like you see, uh, tuple types, uh, generic types, function types. And I must say that they did a pretty good job with the uh, community's feedback, so they just gathered feedback from the user's experience to help have a better system. Um, another one we have is PyLint. Uh, PyLint is a source code analyzer, uh, so it's a command line tool, which looks for programming errors and uh, helps you uh, enforce a better coding standard. So the static checks that it's gonna do is um, they're, they're gonna do basic uh, Python pep8, uh, pep sorry, style guide. Um, they're gonna do some various error detection. So for instance, they're gonna do, um, they're gonna tell you when you have variable that are undeclared, uh, if you have modules that are not important, if you have a news uh, variable. Um, they can also tell you if you have a return statement and you have code after, um, it's gonna say that the control flow will never reach there, so you don't need this code. Uh, it's fully customizable, it's uh, extendable, it's, it's, it's a good piece of uh, library, in my opinion. Uh, last time I checked, there's over 180 different error codes that it can produce. And even the current uh, core maintainer gave an amazing talk uh, Wednesday, uh, which was really nice. It integrates nicely with IDEs, so with VM, Emacs, Eclipse, PyCharm, uh, Minimar, everything is on their website, it's nicely documented. Um, another one that I want to bring up on is PyFlakes. So just as uh, PyLint, it's a command line tool that will um, check your uh, Python source code. Um, it says that uh, compared to PyLint, it's going to be faster because it only parses the, um, the syntax tree of the files. 
and it will never complain about your uh, coding style. Uh, and also it will try very hard to um, never emit false positives. So if there's a warning, uh, it wants to have a real meaningful warning to you and that may be a problem with the parser. Uh, so this is Pyflix. Um, as I said earlier, um, there's a function annotation. This is pep3107. Uh, so this is a syntax that was added to, uh, to Python just, just in time for Python 3 back in 2006. And what it does, it's, it allows you to have ar arbitrary metadata to your method um, signatures, like you can see here. And with those, uh, with those arguments, we're going to be able to get them from the underscore underscore annotations uh, super method. So, if you, so um, this means that the other libraries like PyFlint, uh, like PyLint and PyFlix are, be, are able to use those uh, syntax uh, augmentation to, uh, to help. Um, the next one is um, MyPy. It's an experimental optional static type checker that uh, has been around uh, 2012. It's, uh, it was hev heavily inspired by, Pyth by a Python-based, uh, Python-inspired language, which included an optional static type system. So, as I, so it's an optional static type checker. It's a, it's a, a command line tool that you can use to run against your uh, files and it will, uh, it will use, um, first of all, um, the PEP484 uh, um, type hintings. It's gonna, it has a powerful type system and compile type checking. And the thing is, uh, the author wants you to use the tool after writing your program. So start by writing your code and then add, uh, add your type hints and your uh, right after and then run MyPy to be able to maybe catch bugs or to enforce a certain um, type checks on those. Um, so one, once, once more, um, it uses the, uh, the function annotation and it's gonna use also uh, the uh, PEP484 uh, type hints. And in that case, my Fibonacci uh, method, since it takes uh, an integer, if I pass a string, uh, MyPy will uh, produce an error. Um, so pa uh, there's also PEP484, which is, uh, of course, optional type hints. Um, it, was, it appears since uh, when type annotation started over in 2006, uh, a lot of third-party um, libraries and applications started using those. But it sprung uh, lots of different uh, ways of using it. So PEP, this, this PEP wants to be just a standard, uh, bring a standard way of doing type hinting. And I believe it's gonna be compared to what uh, Wisgi uh, introduced with web frameworks of having a standard way and a baseline for tools to uh, work with that. And of course, uh, as the author states, uh, Python will remain a dynamically typed language and the, aut the authors uh, have no desire of, uh, of making type hints mandatory. Um, I won't go too much in those because even Guido uh, gave a talk. There was a second talk about type hints, so I'm gonna just tell that pep, this pep aims to unify and ease uh, static type checks. Let's, uh, let's go back to our, um, our circle of possibilities we had. So if we include static type, type checking in our program, this means that the, um, the set of possibilities that we have to test against are really lowered but we still have this huge uh, integer set that we are not sure what we should do with that. We could either do some formal proof with our method, but I think this goes against the, the principle of what we want to do. So one way of doing it is using a library called Hypothesis. Uh, once again, a uh, lot of people talked about this uh, this week, so I'm just going to go uh, quickly on what it does. So Hypothesis is a property-based uh, testing library. It's uh, based on Haskell's quick check library, which itself is a combinator library, which was written back in 99. Uh, it's designed to assist you in um, testing your software. So, how, so it's gonna generate data, uh, random data, and it's going to try to, false your, uh, to falsify your assertions of your uh, unit tests. And once, it finds a, once it's gonna find a, a failure, it will try to give you the simplif the, to simplify at most the, uh, the failure. So on a normal unit test, what you're gonna have is uh, you're gonna set up some static data, uh, you're gonna perform some operations, 
and you're, which is the method, for instance, you want to test, and you're going to assert that the result that you get by this, by this operation um, is what you think it is, and is what you expect it to be. The difference with property-based testing is instead of setting static data, it's going to try to um, test data that is going to be matching a specification you're going to be giving it. And I'll show you quickly um, the way it does. So hypothesis will generate random data matching the specification. If, it's find a if it finds a failure, like I said, uh, it will try to give you the, 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 the simplif to simplify um, the, um, the failing data. So let's say that you have a big, uh, big list of integers that fails your test. It's going to try to reduce it to maybe having, if it's having an empty list that fails, or if it's having um, uh, negative integers that make your test failing, it's going to try to reduce it um, completely. And of course, the data is going to be saved locally for a faster, u for a faster test after, since it generates uh, random data and it does uh, lots of tests with it. Um, all right, so I have this huge um, method that we don't really want to care about. It's uh, LZW data compression. I took this literally from the uh, Rules Data Stones website. So I have a compressed method and I have a decompressed method. If I wanted to test it uh, regularly with a unit test, this is what I would do. So I would try to compress my text and then decompress, and I would try to make sure that it stays the same, since it's a lossless compression uh, algorithm. Um, but with hypothesis, what I would do is I would give it a specification, which is with the uh, given decorator, and I would tell it that it's text. Uh, and with this, it's going to try to um, generate random data that are going to be text-based and uh, try to make this assertion fail. And if I run it, it's going to give me one uh, failure that the method has, and it's, of course, that if I have an empty string, uh, it fails. And if we go back to the test, the empty string will fail somewhere there. I think I forgot to uh, put the stack trace. So this is, would be a... Uh, so having, having hypothesis on top of some static analysis uh, would help us to uh, literally test the entire set of possibilities we have. So in conclusion, um, in the 20 minutes we have, uh, type systems are inherently complicated. Uh, but um, even though they're complicated, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to know how, how they work. Uh, both dynamic and static type checking uh, have their cons and their pros, but I think that having both of them living in, your, in a type system could really help devs. Um, PEP484 uh, is going to unify uh, type hinting, and it's going to give more power to uh, develop more type um, checkers in Python. And uh, lastly, of course, hypothesis and other um, fuzzing library uh, can help you to reduce and find bugs early in your development cycle. So uh, this is it. Thank you. If you have uh, any question, feel free. Um, we have some time. Just catch me. Uh, so you were saying that Pyland also does static type checking to some degree. Um, what I want to say is Python wants to use PEP484 to um, add uh, type hints in oh. its checks because it wants to, um, it wants to use the, um, um, I'm forgetting the words in English, sorry, but it wants to, um, to try to uh, use the AST tree of the uh, Python code you have yeah. to um, give you some hints of failure you could have. Okay. So it's, from what I heard, it's, it's something in the work. It, okay. it, it will be done later. Okay, okay, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks.